Ruiz. Hello and welcome to another edition of Truth and Rhythm. Brought to you by FunkinStuff.net, this is the interview show that gets deep in the pocket with contemporary music's foremost masters of the groove. I am your host, Scott Dr. GX Wolfine, musicologist, creative arts journalist, and multimedia pro. Whether you're watching the video version of this show or the audio-only podcast version, I thank you so much for your continued interest and support in this show. If you enjoy this programming, there are several ways to help support Truth and Rhythm, as well as contribute to further enhancements and expansion, plus get some sweet perks and rewards in the process. First, subscribe to the Funkin' Stuff channel on YouTube, which is where Truth and Rhythm lives, and be an advocate by spreading the word among fellow funk, jazz, and R&B music lovers. Second, join Truth and Rhythm's new membership program through Patreon, which features three tiers for truth believers, Truth Seekers, and Truth Crusaders. You can also submit a direct donation to the cause anytime at funkinstuff.net. At that site, which is loaded with awesome content, you can also purchase the book, Everything's on the One, The First Guide of Funk. Shop for official Truth and Rhythm and Funkin' Stuff merchandise, and use the Amazon links for all of your online purchases, which allocates a percentage to this show. Sponsorship opportunities are available as well. Contact me directly at scottg at funkinstuff.net. For those of you who go the extra step in supporting the show, you have my heartfelt gratitude for allowing us to continue to shine the light on those special artists whose quest is to find truth in rhythm. I am pleased to welcome to the Truth and Rhythm Mothership, twin brothers Walter and Wallace Scott, Founding members of a true R&B singing institution, the Wonderful Whispers, beginning their <laughs> career <laughs> out of Los doing? Angeles in 1963. The quintet recorded several singles before releasing their first album in 1970. During the next four decades, the group would go on to produce 20 more studio albums, eight of which landed in the R&B Top 10 and chart 15 Top 10 R&B singles. Equally at home on up-tempo and romantic ballads, the Whispers' classic songs include Let's Go All the Way, Olivia, and The Beat Goes On, Lady, It's a Love Thing, Tonight, Keep on Loving Me, Contagious, Rock Steady, In the Mood, and so many more. The Whispers' honors include induction to the vocal group Soul Music and R&B Music Hall of Fames, and receiving the Rhythm and Blues Foundation's Pioneer Award. In 2020, they ended a 14-year recording hiatus with the timely and hopeful single How Long. Gentlemen, so good to have you. How are you? Oh, we're great, man. How are you doing? Thanks for having us. My pleasure. And uh, where are you coming to us from today? We are in Los Angeles. I see you got a Laker hat on. Are you in Los Angeles also? No, but I'm born and, and raised and uh, just left in 2006. So big time, lifelong Lakers fan. Oh, man. Okay, then. Well, we're all on the same page. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I was living in the uh, Fox Hills area, Culver City, before I uh, moved out here. Oh, I know. I lived there myself for a while. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I miss it, um, but uh, it's pretty good out here, too. Where are you now? Just outside Charlotte. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. So, but you haven't mi migrated over to the Charlotte Hornets. Uh, you still got your Laker hat on. <laughs> oh, no. That'll never happen. That'll never happen. <laughs> um, so... Just for our viewers' sake, uh, we have Scotty uh, on the right with the hat and uh, Walter on the left in the black to uh, keep track. Um, but, um, you know, been a fan for so long, and, you know, you guys probably don't know, but I was a, a, a club DJ for many years uh, in Los Angeles in the 80s at your guys' heyday. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you helped pack so many dance floors for me, uh, whether it was uh, – 
to, to get down or to do the slow dances. So much thanks for that. Yeah, I remember that era. That was that was quite an era. That's uh, that's uh, just the 1980s came in right after the disco era came in and put a lot of R&B acts out of business, if you remember. Yeah, but you guys rolled right with it. We're going we're gonna to talk about that. But first, I want to jump back a little bit and just um, get you guys to comment a little bit on, you know, the uniqueness of, of being twins and that connection that you had coming up and how that's, you know, played into you being so connected musically, too. Yeah, well, actually, we started out as a duo, as uh, we were simply called the Scott Twins. And back in Los Angeles, back in the in the uh, early to middle 60s, there was a disc jockey. His name was Hunter Hancock. And he had a, he would come through L.A. and have a lot of talent shows. And all of the up-and-coming R&B artists and people who wanted to be in R&B would, would, of course, be on the talent show. And Scotty and I, as the Scott Twins, we entered a lot of his talent shows. We won a lot of them, lost some, but won a lot. <laughs> and uh, basically, while doing one of his talent shows as the Scott Twins, we ran into the, this group called the Eden Trio, who would later join us to become the Whispers. As a matter of fact, while we were on that talent show, they were Eden Trio, we were the Scott Twins. And while waiting in the, in the, in the uh, back curtain, we, we started kind of doo-wopping and harmonizing among ourselves. And we said then, you know, after this talent show, why don't we do like everybody else, be like the Temptations and form a vocal group? And that's how the, that's actually how the group got started. Well, about how old were you guys? Oh, God, we had to be uh, 19, 18. 18, 19 years old. Yeah. Wow. And... Um you know, so obviously the Temptations, but who are some of your other inspirations musically? Oh man, we got a lot of them. Scotty and I, we came up. My dad was a just a ferocious jazz enthusiast, so we listened to a lot of jazz. You know, he liked Miles Davis, Sarah Vaughan, Lambert, Hendricks, and Ross, and uh, he was extremely disappointed when we really wanted to go into R and B because that was one generation coming into another. You know, in the 50s and the 60s, jazz was, it was cool. That's what my dad was all about. And uh, he said, R&B, what's that? You know, you can't, you, there's no way you're going to go into R&B. You know, you got to be like uh, Ella Fitzgerald, you know. But, uh, you know, we were teenagers at that time. We wanted to be in the R&B. And if you remember, the Motown sound was becoming as big as it was ever going to be. So that's where we kind of, you know, migrated to. And you guys, you know, released, I understand, several singles in the 60s, but the first album actually came out in 70, and you guys had your first hit in 69 with um, uh, The Time Will Come, right? Yeah, The Time Will Come, yeah, that was right after high school. You know, we had just graduated from Jordan High School in Watts, California, and uh, that was like a little regional hit. You know, it wasn't anything that was big all over the country. But uh, yeah, the time will come. I can't be, you've done your homework. I can't believe you. I barely remember that song myself. <laughs> it was amazing. But yeah, and it was written by Nick Carwell, who we lost in 2016. You know, he was the writer of the group, but he wrote a series of songs that really kept us going and, and really took us to the, the main success that we had. It was all because of him. Wow, and and that kind of kicked it off for you guys. I know, and then, <clears throat> excuse me, you eventually signed with uh, was it Janice? Is that their label? Yeah, Chess Janice. Yeah, yeah. Well, so before that, we were with a uh, with a small production company. Um, a guy by the name of Ron Carson. He had a production company, and he had us signed to his production company. And then he would go to record companies and and uh, you know try to get a deal. But like uh, the time will come. That was under Ron Carson, wasn't it? Yeah, it was like a label. At the, his label was called Soul Clock, and that was that was Ron Carson. The time will come. The biggest hit, if you want to call it a hit, that really started getting us a little notice was a song called "Seems Like I Gotta Do Wrong Before They Notice Me," which is will, will put you in the same mind as what's going on today <laughs> with how long? Because back then the same thing was going on. I mean, sorry to say that, you know, we were being treated even worse then than it is now. And uh, that was our first sort of message song. 
and uh, the time will come. Seems like songs like Great Day. Uh, I don't know if you might not even remember these songs, but that's where that's the direction we were going in back then. How did it feel when you guys first heard you know your record on the radio? Well, you know what? It's funny. I'm glad you asked that question because we had a song which was called The Dip, that the first one we heard on the radio. And when we heard it for the first time, we were all in this little car going to a rehearsal. And the car was owned by Nick. And it, I never forget, it had, <laughs> it had bad breaks. <laughs> but when he heard, we heard the record on the radio, we got so excited that Nick Caldwell stuck his foot out of the car and stopped it. <laughs> yeah, because his brakes would his work. Brakes would work. It's like the Flintstones, yeah. yeah. He actually stopped the car. I, mean, I don't know if it was, he got excited or I mean, the, the, everything kicked in, and we all jumped out the car and went to screaming because we couldn't believe it was us. And it was a, call, a song called The Dip. And it didn't really do nothing, but we, we had never heard ourselves on the radio and it really just ran us crazy. <laughs> wow. So at, at that point or at what point, you know, did your father finally say, okay, maybe these guys are on to something? It took him a while. That wasn't, that didn't do it for him. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. he, he really wanted us to sing bebop. He liked to hear us scat, you know, and uh, Scotty and I, you know, that's kind of where we were from. You know, we listened to the, the jazz vocalists and, uh, I think it wasn't until a, quite a few years later that when we got a bigger hit uh, that my father said, you know what, it, this looks like it might be something. But then there was my mother, on the other hand, she didn't really like any of it. She said, look, I think you got to get a job that has benefits. <laughs> and you're out here trying to do something called rhythm and blues. And she, she really wasn't for that. But uh, my dad was begrudgingly, I mean, he just, he was a jazz fan, and he couldn't understand why we wanted to go into this thing called r and B. I I mean, he heard uh, the Motown sound, but uh, he was, at that point in his life, he was still listening to uh, the jazz stations, and that's kind of what he wanted his twin boys to do. I, you know, to me, I can hear some of that jazz influence in your phrasing and, and the tonality. You know, I think uh, you, you guys, you know, haven't done much real jazz as far as I know, but I think there's definitely some of that influence in there. Yeah, I don't know. Um, you look like you're you're a little younger than us, but uh, groups like the High Lows and the Four Freshmen, uh, my dad loved these. They, they were four-part harmony, five-part harmony, you know, jazz, scat, and that's kind of what he wanted us to do. Uh, and so when we really met up with Nicholas and the other guys who at that point in the 60s, everybody wanted to be like the Temptations and the Four Tops. Uh, you know, we kind of blended where we came from, from a jazz standpoint with that R&B thing. And that's kind of really became the unique style of the Whispers. You know, we were we were scatting as much as we could. And what people didn't know is we were really trying to please our dad to make sure <laughs> to make sure we could get him to come along with the R&B thing. But he was helping you differentiate from, you know, there were so many great singing soul groups back then. So oh, yeah. It was a golden yeah. era for sure. Oh, it really, really was, oh, yeah. man. A lot yeah. of big ones, you know, Smokey and the Miracles, the Four Tops. You know, I'm trying to think of the group that Dennis Edwards was in before he went to the Temptations. I can't even think of that. Yeah, they had the Shaker Tail Feather? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, God. Yeah, he was in, before he joined the Temptations, I remember Dennis Edwards, uh, the impressions you remember all the, I mean this oh, was just, uh, the Dells and and the stylistics yeah, and the Delphonics and yeah, on and on and on you know what an era that was man yeah. yeah so you guys really had your work cut out to compete in that kind of environment yeah, but at the same time yeah. I'm sure it was very inspiring too well you know that that's that's what made it so great uh, compared to today the the competition was just king I mean it was just ferocious and what I mean. Like every group really considered it uh, very important to be well rehearsed. I mean, they went in, they would shed it, and and we come out on these shows against other groups, and uh, you know, depending on how well rehearsed you were and and how good your act was, that determined how long you were going to be here. 
And we we were at the beginning of our career. We saw these acts, you know, uh, the Temptations, they were the stalwarts. I mean, they were the group that everybody imitated. And we were no different. The only difference, we didn't have a bass singer. We didn't have an Otis in our group. But uh, we definitely had, you know, the routines. If you remember, man, when you saw a stand-up vocal group, you saw an incredible show, you know, with the routines. The, you know, everybody was well-dressed. You know, you saw the splits. That's kind of what we were doing, you know. And the competition was just ferocious. I mean, but after the show was over, people went, they got along. Today, <laughs> the younger guys, they literally shoot at each other. <laughs> It's crazy. it's crazy, you know? Madness, yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, in your guys' earlier incarnation, you know, on um, Janus Records, it was sort of like a, a little more of like an East Coast, uh, Philly kind of flavor, you yes. know, that you guys were doing. Can you talk about that era some? Yeah, that was incredible. The Chess Janus era, we were being managed by Dick Griffey, who would later become the owner of Solar Records, but he was our manager at that time. And Chess Janice sent us back to Philadelphia to work with the Philadelphia International, who was, you know, uh, Gamble, Gamble and Huff. So our label, uh, Chess Janice, sent us back to work with these producers. And we never got to work with Kenny Gamble, Leon Huff. We worked with some of their producers. We never even, I mean, we saw them a couple of times. But back then, that's, that's what was happening. Uh, you know, there were two hot producers. All the record companies would send their, their acts to work with those producers. So that's what happened to the Whispers. And of course, we went back and, and did a series, a lot of songs, you know, Living Together in Sin, Mother for My Children. These were all produced by Kenny Gamble, Leon Hus, their people, not them. But uh, that's how it was done back then, you know. And uh, we had, you know, the hits were, re they weren't big hits, but they, they, they really worked to shape our image uh, back back then. I, yeah, I saw Bunny Sigler was uh, involved. Oh, yeah. Bunny, yeah. Wow. What a great guy, man. Did you know Bunny? I didn't know him personally, but I've certainly heard a lot of stories. Oh, yeah. What a, yeah. He worked with the OJs, the Dramatics. I mean, he was a guy from Kenny Gamble, Leon Huff's, you know, from their stable. When you went to work with Kenny, he was one of the first producers that they would assign to work with other groups. Norman Harris, he was also a, a great producer, ended up uh, producing and arranging uh the MFSB, the mother, father, you know, the big, they did all of that. And man, what a joy it was back then to work with those guys. Yeah, I had uh, Earl Young on the show not too long ago. And Earl it was really Jones. fun talking wow. about all those days. Yeah, he did most of those hits. Me and Mrs. Jones, uh, the, what's the two guys, both of them, uh, uh, ain't no stopping us now. I mean, that's all. Oh, yeah. He, he was on top of all of that. Yeah, those guys were bad. They were young producers eager to get hits. And, uh, man, what was the name of the Ain't No Stopping Us Now, the two producers? We, we, oh, we never got McFadden to, and Whitehead. Was, McFadden, McFadden and Whitehead. There you yeah. go. We wanted to work with them. We never got a chance to work with them. Hmm. So when you guys were cutting those records, you know, what was it like in the studio? And how much input did, did you have? Or were you mostly directed? Or how did that work? Well, with, in the beginning, we had very little input. We wanted to have, uh, but, you know, you didn't have the clout. You were a young guy coming up. So when we went to work with Kenny's people, they did everything. Uh, when we later came back and uh, Dick had formed Solar Records, we were very lucky because we ran into producers who were really on their way up. Leon Silvers, uh, you know, we it was just incredible. This guy, he... he uh, was a protege of uh, the guy in Motown. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to think. Oh, man. The guy, that, the, the big producer, he, the late, uh, he wrote everything that the Temps did in the early stages. I can't think of his name, but he was a protege of his. Lamont Dozier? No, not Lamont no, Dozier. He, um, they were all part of that stable, though, not Lamont. Papa was a Rolling Stone. He did that. Oh, Norman Whitfield. Norman, Norman Whitfield. Whitfield. Yeah, that's the guy. Yeah. And so we, we were lucky enough to, to run into Leon Silvers when he was really forming as a producer. Uh, we had no idea that uh, when we went in to do And the Beat Goes On, that it would be as big a hit as it was. But once we finished, we kind of knew. But as far as our input, we didn't do that until later in our career, where actually once we got the hits, we literally started producing ourselves. But back then, 
as a young as a young group, you had very little input. Uh, Chess Janice told us go back work with Kitty Gamble, Leon Huff, and do what they tell you to do, and that's it. <laughs> you know. Yeah, that's what they were used to. That was like a, yeah, that's like a um, assembly line. That's exactly right. Yeah. Uh, and you guys had that sort of transitional period where you were on the Soul Train label, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, how did that transition work? And, you know, what what happened that it eventually went from that to Soar? Well, that was Dick, Dick Griffey and Don Cornelius who really hooked up. You know, at the time, Dick, here's what they had. Dick Griffey was probably the biggest black promoter in the country back in those days. Don Cadiz was a television guy. And when he came along with Soul Train, I mean, it was the first time black people got a chance to see themselves on television. And to his credit, he's the one that he's responsible for, as far as I'm concerned, every major black act you see today, he's the one that really gave them that start because every one of them ended up on Soul Train one way or the other. But they decided to put it together, Dick Griffey and Don Cadiz. And it worked for a while, but because of their egos, you know, they, they both was crazy. So it just didn't, uh, it, it ended up going, Dick Griffey said, hey, you do your thing, I'm going to do mine. That's how Solar came about. Because Don had a set of ideas from Soul Train that he wanted. Dick had a set of ideas. And Dick was a little more from the recording side, a little more successful than Don. Well, you know what, to add to it, do you hear two guys, we always say this, had they been smart enough and lacked a little more ego, they could have been the biggest black, probably promoter, TV record guys that ever lived, but they were their own worst enemy. Both of them wanted to imitate Barry Gordy at Motown. So, of course, they created the record label, and it was called Soul Train Records. But as Scotty said, as they went along, the two of them couldn't just they couldn't bring themselves to work together. And I, we will never forget this. We went out on the road uh, recording for Soul Train Records. We came back home and went to Soul Train Records and there were locks on the door. <laughs> Don Cornelius, he, he cut all of his ties and all of the acts that was under Soul Train Records actually went to the Los Angeles small record label of Solar. And, and what we had no idea what was happening between these two men. They fell out, and Don Cornelius cut his tie immediately. And, of course, uh, Dick salvaged uh, you know, the, all of the acts that were on the label, and that's how Sol Solar Records was created. And it went on to become you know, a great little independent. Dick, as I said, they both wanted to be like Barry Gordy. But uh, when it became Solar Records, Dick was basically imitating what he thought, you know, the Barry, that Barry Gordy did in Motown. Only difference is that Dick Griffey gave the artist, he wasn't as knowledgeable. He was a great, in fact, he was a jazz guy himself. He came from the jazz era, but he understood what was happening with R&B. And it, it wasn't overtaking jazz, but obviously, let's be honest, the airplay versus R&B and jazz, there was, a, there was no comparison. So Dick had enough sense to uh, acquire a lot of acts. Leon Silvers with his group Dynasty, Midnight Star from the Ohio era, Lakeside, later on Lakeside, Shalimar, Climax, Climax. Climax. I mean, it became yeah, huge. It yeah. became huge. And and uh, you know, if if it hadn't have been for one word, I call it ego. This this little label probably would have gone to surpass Motown, but obviously that didn't happen. Wow, that's amazing when you think about yeah, it's it. It's a shame when you think yeah. about it. Yeah. Wow. And I I think wasn't Dick Griffey a, a drummer uh, background too a little bit? That was sort of like his dabbling in music uh years kind ago. He played the keyboards a little bit. Keyboards. You know, but he could tell you, I mean, he came along when Miles Davis and Dizzy Gillespie were in their prime. You know, he was he was about a generation ahead of us. So his real knowledge was of jazz. And he really thought kind of like my father, that R&B was a come down from jazz, <laughs> you know, but he understood that R&B in his mind could make more money. I mean, you know, let's face it, you know, when Motown came about, it became pretty clear that R&B was the music of the day. Mm -hmm. So Dick being a very smart guy understood that. 
I'll tell you something else we have to give Dick Griffey a lot of credit for. He was a great A&R guy. What I mean by that, he did have the knowledge to hear hits better than a lot of people. That's, that's, what, that's what Barry Gordy, that's where his strength was. People talk about all the acts, but Barry Gordy, in other words, he had the ability to hear what the, what the mass wanted. See, at least with black people anyway. And Dick was a lot like that. Even though he was a jazz guy, he could go in and tell Midnight Star, hey man, this song is going to be a better hit than what you got. I mean, he took, we actually had songs that was written for us that he said, no, no, you don't. You need to keep that. The Whispers have enough hits. You need this hit. And he <laughs> was right. You know, he could hear those. So he was more of an A&R guy you you get confused a little bit when you when you bring up the jazz part about him, but to me, his true talent was being able to hear hits, which is why Solar was as, as successful as it was. Absolutely, that is no small talent, you know. Oh, I'm, I'm thinking of a that. guy like Clive Davis and, and those yeah. guys. Yeah, absolutely, Clive same way, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I was looking at your um, history of albums, so it seems like um, Open Up Your Love was the last one you did, I think, before Solar. And I think, you know, when you listen to that, you can kind of hear some of that transition beginning in the sound, I think. Yeah, um, absolutely right. You know? Uh, and that, that title track was great, too, on that one. Really liked it. Yeah, that was a great... Uh, Open Up Your Love didn't do on the... It didn't sell like what we wanted to, but, boy, the performances and the vocal things that were, that was done... You know, we did, we went from blues to jazz to R&B on that song. There's a lot of songs on there that really hit all the areas. And you're right, you, you could see where we were beginning to go from that from that album on, you know. But, you know, you, you're in the business like we are. You, a hit is something that, that kind of knocks everything down. Once you get a hit, uh, everything that you've done in the past, that's all forgotten. And everything that you're going to do in the future is based on what you did in, in getting that hit. And that's kind of what happened to us. You know, in 1979, 80, we went into the studio uh, with Leon Silvers. And like I said, we didn't really know what it was going to do. But in those days, once you finished a product in the studio, if you were kind of caught scratching your head and asking people, what do you think about this? In all honesty, you didn't have nothing. But if you finished that studio with a song and everyone agreed that that was pocket, and you had something, that's what happened with And The Beat Goes On. When we finished And The Beat Goes On, we all said that if this is not a hit, then we're gonna do what my mom said. It's time to look for some jobs with benefits. <laughs> but little did we know, a month and a half later, that album was gold. I mean, it, it and a hit just, it stops everything. It was 500,000, then it was a million, and then it was two million. And it was really uh, nothing that we could do about it. The momentum hit, and the next thing we knew, we had a hit that couldn't be stopped. You know, and for the next seven years after, you know, it it just changed everything. When you first heard that particular cut, did you did you think it was going to be a hit? I uh, know we knew, we knew, we, we knew. We said to ourselves, and and I, I always tell people, real hits. It, when you hear it, you just know it. I mean, respect. Aretha Franklin's respect. I mean, when I first heard it, whether I liked it or not, I knew it was a hit. You know, uh, it, it was the same way when we finished And The Beat and we did the big playback like they do in the studio and everybody goes crazy. We knew that was going to be our... Now, we didn't know it was going to be as big as it got, but we knew it was going to be a hit. And that's when people always ask us, what's our favorite song? That, to me, that's why that's my favorite song because... The other reason why we knew it was a hit because from that point on our lives changed. Once we did and the beat goes on, you know, we left the chitlins and we went to pork chops. <laughs> you know, and we just that's the only way I can explain it because life changed from and the beat goes on, which was in 79-80 to 1987-89, everything we touched was either gold or platinum. Yeah, I mean, you guys were dominant in that era. And, I mean, yeah. Solar in general just was on fire. But you guys were like yeah. at the, the tip of that spear, you know? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And, From a creative standpoint, when you said Solar was on fire, when you think about what was happening, Leon Silvers, 
uh, later on, Babyface and L.A. Reid, which came a little later. But these people were in their prime. And Leon's work with Shalimar is just, I mean, it was, uh, I mean, incredible. I can't even talk about it. I can't brag on it enough. Because he was, he came into his own as a producer, and uh, he made that group. Shalimar went to London, and they outdrew the Whispers. You name it, they were the biggest act very that Solar white. had. Very mm -hmm. white, and this was uh, from a series of songs that was produced by Leon Silvers. I mean, you you know their record. You know, I mean, all of their songs just went across the board. And of course, we had and the beat goes on, and we came with you know it's a love thing from Leon Silvers, right. and as you say, here's this little this little label in Los Angeles, trying to be like Motown, and for about twelve years, I mean, it was unstoppable. It just really was. And you know, like I said, I grew up in Los Angeles, went to Santa Monica High School, and you know, was a disc jockey and all that. So, I mean. I was right there in the heart of it. You know, I, I don't know how much it got played around the country, but all I can right. say is where I was, I mean, it was just out, every hour, so many of those solar songs were in the rotation. Absolutely. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it was, it was, you couldn't stop it. It was, that's, that's the power of a hit is what we always say. When you got hits, nothing can get us its way. It rolls over everything. And, and that album was so great. I mean, you know, uh, Lady was just such a great ballad. Um, and uh, Out the Box is funky. Um, yeah, yeah. The song for Donnie was just so touching. Yeah, it, was, you know? it was simply called The Whispers. Yeah. You know, we didn't even we didn't even put a whole lot of time in trying to, well, what are we going to call this? Because every song, we had a song for Donnie, Lady, uh, say out, yes. the, out the Box, Say Yes. Say I Yes became bigger than Lady. It was never released as a single. And it really... Uh, a, from a popularity standpoint, it was it was bigger than, and the lady was playing like on the radio every fifteen minutes. <laughs> I never will forget. My wife told me she said, "If I hear lady one more time, I'm gonna have a wreck if I'm driving," <laughs> because you know about the rotation. You know when you got a hit, you're gonna hear it. You're gonna hear it a lot. You know. Yeah. Well, there are a lot of songs with lady in them, like three times a lady and whatever, a million yeah. of them. But but this one was probably my favorite with lady in it. Um, that album went to number one on the R&B yeah. chart and also went to number six pop. Is that right? Yeah, right. number six pop. That's wow. right. Yep. Yeah, the biggest album that we've ever had, no question. It's funny, people to write today, they tell us, that, man, what was it like after having the beat with such a big hit like Rock Steady? And we always have to correct them. And the beat goes on was bigger than Rock Steady. It simply was the biggest record that we, it was a, that was a bona fide double platinum album, two million sales and, and counting. Rocksteady was a million plus. It was platinum. It, it never made it to the two million mark. But again, by that time, because radio was so powerful, most people thought that Rocksteady was bigger than that. The beat goes on, but it really was not. No wasn't even close. What was it like uh, working with, with Leon? Oh, we tell people this all the time. This guy... Uh, you know, he came from the Silvers. I'll give you a quick story. We went, the first time we went to New York City to the Apollo Theater, we opened for the Silvers. We hadn't we hadn't had and to beat it at this point. But if you remember, the Silvers were the group that radio, that the record company wanted to imitate the Jacksons. They had the big naturals. And I mean, they, they had an actual move where they waved their head like the Jacksons and the natural would fly in the air and so forth. But Leon Silvers was the oldest of, of the brother, a bass player. But as a producer, I wish people to this day could, could, could know how talented this guy was. Leon Silvers would come into the studio and before the rhythm track was cut, you would see Leon Silvers in the studio and you wouldn't hear him. He'd be on his knees with, in front of a, of a drum bass, set. Bass drum. And he'd literally be with his hand doing the bass on the bass drum. And in his mind, from the bass drum to the snare to the toms, he would play that drum set. He knew what he wanted. That's the way and the beat was cut. From the bass drum up. And, and you know, an easier way of saying it, Leon was the drum machine before there the was a drum, drum machine. machine. 
Yeah. He was a human drum machine. Yeah. Because what he was doing, I remember we used to be back there giggling and we would see him out there on his knees and he to do to do that just for for one for thirty minutes, that's all you'd hear. To do to do what the hell was he doing? <laughs> yeah. You know. But when he finished with what he was doing, then he'd go and do with the sock symbol. He had a stroke for that. He'd do the entire He'd drum the thing, thing. And then because he was naturally a bass player, then he would he would do, after he finished what he was doing with the drum set, he'd go to the bass. And from that lock of the drum, he'd start playing the bass. And then he'd have guys come in who played the guitar and he'd add the keyboards to it. And that's how the rhythm track was cut to add the beat goes on. Yeah. But it was all in his head before it ever took place. And what was fascinating to me about it, he knew what it was going to sound like, but we didn't. No. You know, at the, at the end, because what he went through to get it made him look like he was kind of crazy. Yeah. But when you heard what he ended up with, then you understood the genius of Leon Silvers. I, I think he's the greatest R&B. All you got to do is listen to the Whispers' work and Shalimar's work and Dynasty's work, and you'll see that's all Leon, one man. That's the greatness of Leon Silver. That's, he did all of that. Your baby faces and all these people that came after, they were listening to him. They were imitating they him. They were imitating yeah. him. Yeah, that's true. And he, he didn't he didn't get the credit, but, I mean, he was incredible. Yeah. Well, the work speaks for itself, no doubt. Yeah, yep. There's much more to this great Truth and Rhythm interview. Just continue on to the next part of the episode. Also, be sure to subscribe to this channel. If you've already done so, please share it with friends. And become a member by joining Truth and Rhythm on Patreon or consider donating at funkinslift.net. Thank you very much.